Welcome everybody. A reminder to reporters on the line that the Premier is going to have some remarks to start off. But if you want to queue to ask a question, please press star one right now. Uh, greetings, everybody, and uh, it's a great day here at the University of Victoria. I was very proud to swear in uh, the cabinet that will be in place as we try to get through the challenges of COVID as effectively and as seamlessly as possible. A few firsts, I'm very proud to say that Kat Conroy is the first woman forest minister in BC history. She'll be working with the first woman forester who was appointed uh, five years ago, I believe. And I think that will give a, a fresh look at how we manage forestry going forward. I'm very, very pleased to have such a diverse and dynamic team at the cabinet table, as well as being supported by young people in their 30s and 40s, uh, whether it be as uh, parliamentary secretaries or working with the new government caucus committees that we put in place to make sure that all members of this new large 57 person caucus is engaged in the decision making that government has to involve itself in each and every day. I'm also looking forward to working with Shirley Bond as the leader of the opposition. Shirley and I have been colleagues for 15 years and although we disagree on many, many things, there's a mutual respect that's been built up over many, many years and I wish her all the best as she embarks on her term as uh, the leader of the official opposition. Similarly, I look forward to continuing to work with uh, Adam Olson and Sonia Firstenau from the Green Caucus. We accomplished a great deal working together in the last parliament and I'm confident we can continue to work together on the many issues that affect British Columbians now and into the future. And with that, I'm, I know there's a lot of questions. I'm happy to answer as many as I can. Question for, oh. <laughs> We're gonna start with a question from Shannon Waters. Go ahead, Shannon. Um, I wanted to ask about mental health and addictions. We just got another um, heartbreaking update about the number of British Columbians who died from fatal overdoses in October. The province is on route to potentially having the worst year it has ever had when it comes to this public health emergency. Um, can you tell us how your approach, your cabinet's approach to this issue might change and ramp up in the future? Well, we have been working tirelessly over the past three and a half years to, before COVID arrived, to knock back uh, the number of people whose lives were taken uh, from opioids. Uh, the addiction crisis continues. Uh, I'm sure, I know, and I'm confident that Sheila Malcolmson, the new minister responsible for mental health and addictions, will be uh, diving right in first thing tomorrow morning uh, to get working on the issues that uh, Judy Darcy had made such great progress on. We have committed through the election campaign to more treatment beds. We've committed to working uh, with uh, police chiefs and with the federal government and uh, local governments as well to make sure that uh, we decriminalize and destigmatize addictions. These are critical steps forward. But the biggest challenge we face right now is COVID-19 and the impact that's having on people, the impact that's having on our ability uh, to get to those who are, uh, are using, those who are struggling with addictions, those who are experiencing overdoses, uh, and that has led tragically uh, to the increased loss of life over the past number of months. Uh, I know that all British Columbians are committed to working together to address not just COVID-19, but also the opioid crisis and the climate crisis. Uh, these concurrent issues uh, need to have our attention every single day, and having a standalone minister who's focused on that was a commitment I made in 2017 and recommitted to today. Do you have a follow-up, Shannon? I do. Um, first of all, uh, are you planning on increasing your investments in mental health and addictions? And then also, the city of Vancouver is looking for a workaround when it comes to decriminalization, essentially going it alone with the province not planning to move forward without the federal government. Vancouver is planning to ask for its own variance. What's your reaction to that move? Well, we, in 2017, we directed uh, that uh, we would not prosecute uh, simple possession. Uh, so we were already uh, acting on, on those issues. Uh, what I believe we need is national leadership. It's a criminal code issue. Uh, I've talked to the Prime Minister, I've talked to the federal government through uh, the Intergovernmental Relations uh, Ministry, and we're working uh, cooperatively with the federal government, and we want to continue, of course, to work with the City of Vancouver and other municipal governments on these issues. But at the end of the day, what we need to do is make sure that we're helping those who are struggling, and that means uh, putting more frontline workers in place. And, and as we uh, get into the budget process for uh, this coming year of 2021, 2022, uh, I know that there are going to be requests and, and calls for more resources, and we're going to uh, do our level best to meet those. But uh, safe uh, alternatives, uh, 
uh, prescription alternatives uh, to get safe supply is an issue that the community has been talking about for a long time. We want to make sure that we can realize that by doing it in a way that makes sense to everybody. And I know that uh, Minister Malcolmson is going to be focusing on that first thing tomorrow morning. Our next question is from Rob Shaw, Vancouver Sun. Oh, hi, uh, Premier. Could you speak a bit about um, Ravi Kalon's ministry involving economic recovery uh, and jobs? How does that fit into um, the, the kind of plan for government to recover from uh, COVID when we're sort of in the middle of uh, this second wave? Yeah, well, Minister Callon is taking on an enormous responsibility. It's a, it's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, bits and pieces in the ministry. We've added a bunch more uh, through the uh, transition process. Uh, the recovery initiatives that we announced in September will now be overseen by Ravi. We have had a cross-government approach to recovery uh, from the beginning, but uh, Ravi will be the point person and I'm confident that uh, he is going to make sure everything that we can do will be done so that the economic recovery that we need to follow uh, from uh, the second wave and into uh, the uh, therapeutics and other options with respect to vaccines that we hope to see in the early part of the first quarter of next year. Uh, Ravi, uh, Minister Dix, uh, working with uh, Minister Robinson and others will be on the point on that. And, and I, Ravi is a, a new minister, but someone who I've known for a long, long time. I have full confidence in him. And uh, he is uh, up for the, chat, uh, for the challenge, and, and I, I gave him as many tasks as I thought he could handle. Rob, do you have a follow-up? Uh, and I know she's not on here anymore, Carol James having um, retired, but um, have you given any thought to her helping you in some way, even though she's no longer a minister? Uh, I have. Uh, Carol's agreed to uh, stay on as a special advisor to me. Uh, the order in council, I believe, uh, I signed today with Janet Austin. Uh, I'm going to pay her the princely sum of a dollar. I offered her five bucks for a five-year contract. She said, I'll take it a dollar at a time. So uh, Carol has agreed to stay on for the next year working with me and, and also uh, assisting uh, other ministers and other caucus members. Uh, as you know, Rob, Carol uh, doesn't just bring uh, competence to her task. She brings compassion and an understanding of the challenges that we face uh, in our communities and in our province. So uh, I'm very grateful that Carol has agreed to stick around for at least a year. And as I say, I've got, uh, I got five bucks in my pocket and hopefully we'll be able to keep her for more than the one year. Our next question is from Justine Hunter, Global Mail. Thanks, uh, Premier. The, the federal government has indicated we will be way behind other provinces in rolling out a vaccine. So hope for that kind of relief maybe months away. We heard yesterday a bit from Dr. Henry about some new capacity for rapid testing but what extra measures will the province take now this new cabinet to keep people safe while we wait for that vaccine well we have a parliamentary secretary for seniors and long-term care uh, that's mabel elmore she'll be working with minister dix uh, to make sure that we are focused on uh, the hirings that we committed to during the election campaign so that we have more people working in the healthcare sector to keep people safe. That's not just for COVID, but that's gonna carry on well beyond that. The challenges of rebuilding our long-term care capacity is something that Minister Dix took on day one uh, when he was sworn in in 2017. And we've made a lot of progress. COVID came along, of course, and, and disrupted virtually everything. People understand that. And uh, we're gonna continue to work uh, with long-term care facilities and, and uh, rapid testing as a component of that. For the here and now, Dr. Henry is concerned about the capacity uh, to deliver. Uh, we'll have to see how we can do on that, but I'll certainly be directed and guided by her expert advice in that regard. In terms of what we can continue to do, of course, is, uh, you know, the, the, I missed today uh, the First Minister's uh, meeting uh, for the swearing in. I'll be talking to uh, Nick LeBlanc, uh, the uh, Intergovernmental Affairs Minister federally to catch up on the events of today and I have a very positive working relationship as you know with the federal government at this time and we're going to continue to do what we can to make sure that British Columbia is front and center not just on pandemic relief but a whole host of other initiatives that we believe working cooperatively together will improve the lives of British Columbians. Justine do you have a follow-up? Yes thanks. The federal government has been warning that there's a limit to its pandemic aid Walk us through the gaps, please, between what your government has asked for from Ottawa and what it has actually received. Well, on the pandemic side, uh, we did very well, all provinces. We've been meeting regularly, as you know, for months, uh, with uh, weekly with uh, premiers and then with first ministers, uh, Minister Freeland initially and now Minister LeBlanc. 
Uh, and uh, I'm very confident that the gaps as we uh, find them, are, we're doing our, our best to fill them. A good example would be uh, on transit and on municipalities. Those were areas that were not discussed uh, initially in the March, April, May period. It wasn't until we got into July and August as we were getting the, uh, the recovery funds together at the federal level that we highlighted the importance of, we started here in British Columbia and other provinces followed along, the importance of making sure that that public infrastructure had the same level of support that some of the private sector uh, firms were getting from the federal government. Uh, the Prime Minister agreed, Minister Freeland agreed, and we were able to flow some $2 billion, uh, joint federal provincial monies to Transit, TransLink, BC Ferries, and of course municipalities. So the gaps as we find them, Justine, we t uh, attempt to try and fill them at the moment. One example would be the quarter of a billion dollars for education that came uh, admittedly late in the, in the pre preparing for the start of the school year in late August, early September. But that's a quarter of a billion dollars we were able to put towards uh, uh, making sure that we had cleaning uh, capacity within our system, make sure we hired enough support staff and teachers uh, to do the work that was required to make our, our K-12 system safe. So my approach and the approach that uh, I thankfully is being uh, embraced by the federal government, as we bring issues forward, uh, we talk about them in bilateral relationships and then we talk about them at multilateral tables with other provinces uh, to get the resources and the cooperation and the collaboration on the issues that we need to. Uh, when it comes to the vaccine, for example, the distribution of vaccines, uh, we believe we're well advanced here with infrastructure. Dr. Henry agrees with that. We have more work to do to be sure. Uh, but we've always tried to lead the way at these conferences and always tried to demonstrate our ability and our capacity and our desire to work effectively and collaboratively with the federal government. Our next question is from Richard Zisman Global. Are you there, Richard? We will come back. I'm to here. You. Oh, he's there. There you go. Can you hear me, Jen? Can now. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, did uh, Minister Rob Fleming ask to be moved out of education? And what can you say about the shift uh, in education, considering uh, how many challenges and criticisms there have been around some elements of the back to school plan? Well, first of all, uh, Rob served uh, at my request as the critic for education for two and a half years before. I uh, asked him to serve as Minister of Education. He uh, was able to negotiate uh, with the BC Teachers Federation the first collective bargaining agreement between the two parties in decades. Uh, he's done a very, very good job. I'm proud of the work that our government has done to bring peace back to the education sector. But during these difficult times, the very challenging times for, for families, for teachers, for other people who work in the, in the system, uh, QP members and other support staff, administrators, these have been very challenging times. And I'm proud of the work that Rob and the government has done to lay the table for that collaborative approach, uh, responding to the need for troubleshooters, for example, to make sure that when issues emerge, we were able to address them right away. Rob was front and center on those issues. Very proud of the work that he's done, uh, but I wanted to move him on to other activities. He's got a background in economic development. He wanted an economic ministry. Uh, transportation and highway, transportation infrastructure rather, uh, was available because of the retirement of Claire Trevena. It seemed an appropriate move, and I'm very excited about what uh, Jennifer Whiteside is going to bring to the table with her understanding uh, coming from the health sector, uh, operating a large organization with diverse stakeholders, which is very much like our K-12 system. We want to focus on kids and outcomes for children. We want to make sure that the environment, the work environment, and the educational environment is as robust as it can be, and Jennifer's up to that task. Do you have a follow-up, Richard? Considering uh, recent stories in Ontario and Alberta, can you say whether, as the Premier, you ever interfered with any of the health orders that Dr. Bonnie Henry has put in place, or have you ever provided advice to Dr. Henry around putting in specific orders to help benefit BC's economy? Uh, no, I've never interfered. Uh, that's not how uh, uh, Minister Dix, uh, Stephen Brown, the Deputy Minister, and Dr. Henry and I uh, operate. Uh, my Deputy Don Wright, as well as uh, my Chief of Staff, Jeff Meggs, uh, are in daily contact with public health officials, daily contact with Minister Dix, have been for months. Uh, we come to conclusions based on the best advice we get from public health, and then we implement those decisions in the best interest of British Columbians. And uh, 
I can't certainly recall, in fact, I know I did not interfere in any way. Uh, we made a decision early on uh, that the challenges that we were facing were not going to be short-term challenges. It wasn't going to be a couple of months and we're back to normal. We knew this was going to be grueling. Uh, issues and events around the world have proven that out. And I'm very comfortable with the approach that we've taken from public health uh, to the Minister of Health to the Cabinet and then decisions being made. I also I want to tip my cap to uh, to Minister Mike Farnworth, uh, Public Safety and uh, Solicitor General from the emergency management perspective. Our approach has always been how do we find solutions to these problems? We resisted and I remember some criticism at the time uh, there was lockdown, lockdown, uh, question after question during scrums at the early part of the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Henry's approach, Minister Dix's approach, my approach was let's find ways to safely operate. Let's find ways to keep the economy going with public health front and center. We were successful in the first wave. We've got challenges today, but we have a track record of success together with a, a collaborative approach, and I'm going to continue doing that. Our next question is from Binder Saj, CTV. Hi, Premier. Um, just wanted to ask you about Selena Robinson taking over as finance minister. Just wondering what it is that you saw in her as housing minister that made you think she would be a good fit for this role. Well, Selena and I have uh, work, been working together since she was elected in 2013. I knew her before uh, she was elected to uh, the NDP caucus at that time. Uh, I have a tremendous uh, uh, trust in her capacity. I gave her an awful lot to do. Uh, on the housing file, on the uh, municipal affairs file, and throughout the pandemic, and you can confirm this with uh, any mayor, any councillor around British Columbia, she was available every day, every week, every month for the past nine months to make sure we were sharing information, we were hearing back from communities what the challenges were. It was her effort that got us to the table with the federal government to start talking about resources for municipalities. Her understanding of the people of British Columbia is, is unmatched. Uh, I'm very confident that she will be an outstanding finance minister. I'm really looking forward to working with her. Cinder, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, just uh, back to the vaccines. I'm just wondering how it works when you talk to the federal government about the vaccine supply. Um, right now, BC has way more active cases per capita than Ontario and Quebec. Is that something that figures into the discussion, or how does it work? Well, that's an interesting question because at the front end, of course, you'll remember British Columbia's case count was quite low relative to other jurisdictions. And uh, at the time, we continued to talk about per capita funding, uh, whether it be for uh, safe restarts, whether it be for other initiatives about making sure PPE was distributed as it came into the country. There were shortfalls that you'll remember at the beginning of the pandemic, not a concern today. Uh, so we've always worked uh, from my perspective that all provinces are equal uh, and all provinces have, uh, d uh, despite that, all provinces have different needs and different requirements. Uh, so I believe we'll continue to work. Uh, I know that we're going to, if we listen to public health, if we, if we try to break the circuit that seeing transmission uh, get out of hand in Fraser Health, but, ex but not exclusively in Fraser Health, I think we can get back to a place where British Columbians can be comfortable that we've done our individual part and our community part uh, to bend the curve back to something that's more acceptable. Uh, as we await the vaccines, however, we need to be preparing for that. And that's the type of thing that Dr. Henry and Minister Dix bring to cabinet. We talk about that. What resources do we need to deploy uh, when those vaccines become available? But the procurement, uh, the distribution, or the, the, the creation and procurement uh, of, of the vaccines is a federal responsibility and we're going to be working uh, with other provinces to make the case that uh, when those uh, vaccines become av available, when therapeutics have been tested and, and can be used uh, in our acute care and uh, ICU uh, facilities, that, that we are at, at the front of the line with everybody else saying these are our needs and I know the federal government will do its best to make sure that they distribute those uh, therapeutics and vaccines in a fair and equitable way. Uh, that's uh, my job to make that case and I'll continue to do that. Our next question is from Mary Griffin, check. Oh, hi, thanks so much. Uh, Premier, I am um, just wondering if uh, the six cabinet ministers from the island is an actual record and just your thinking into having so uh, much of cabinet represented from the island. Yes, uh, well, I'm a, a born and raised Islander, but I don't want you to read too much into that. Uh, I looked at the talents. We have 57 MLAs. Uh, we've got those with significant experience. We have those who have just arrived, happy to be here. 
Uh, I looked at the, the holes in the cabinet as a result of re retirements. I looked at the people who wanted a, uh, to take on a fresh start. I wanted to make sure that people were excited about coming to work every day. Uh, and I think we've managed to get, find that balance. Uh, having parliamentary secretaries uh, who are going to be learning the ropes, uh, uh, Kelly Green from uh, Richmond and Environment, uh, Dan Coulter doing accessibility uh, uh, from Chilliwack, uh, Andrew Mercier doing skills development from, uh, from Langley. These are places that have not been represented uh, in NDP activities until today. But uh, I looked at the, the skills and the talents of the people on the island and I, I appointed the cabinet based on uh, needs and experience. And quite frankly, uh, the number is higher than it's ever been, I'm sure. But that wasn't the objective. The objective was to put the best people in place to meet the needs of British Columbians. And I think I've, I, I'd, I'd like to think I've found that balance. It's up to, uh, uh, to you and the media to decide whether I've met that test. Do you have a follow up, Mary? I do. It kind of has to do with during your swearing in. Was that a tribute to Star Trek and your acknowledgement as a, a, a nerd? Yeah, your... well, I, I, quite, quite honestly, I was just, I was, I, I, it wasn't until after it had happened that it was brought to my attention. I, I'm, a, I'm a geek, I'm a nerd, I, I can't help it. I, I do that a lot. Uh, I was standing with my hand up in the air. I didn't mean any disrespect to anybody. I wasn't sending a signal to uh, geeks everywhere, but. Uh, that's who I am. Our next question is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Thank you. Um, Premier, I'm wondering if you can speak about your choice for Indigenous Relations Minister. Uh, it was one year ago exactly that uh, UNDRIP was implemented in BC, and we're coming up almost on a year um, that yeah. the Wet'suwet'en conflict was, you know, the biggest headline in, in the province and the country. Yeah. What is your direction for Murray Rankin in keeping those relations strong going forward? Well, we are uh, committed to making sure that the uh, MOU that was signed by the federal and provincial governments with uh, Wet'suwet'en uh, hereditary leadership uh, is realized. That that means working with elected representatives and the people in Wet'suwet'en territory to find out what governance model they want to adopt for themselves. It's up to the Wet'suwet'en to figure that out. That was our position in February. It's our position today. Of course, COVID's made it very difficult for communities uh, in a vast territory like the Wet'suwet'en Territory to come together and to resolve the issues that they need to resolve internally. Uh, with respect to Murray Rankin, uh, he's a noted uh, scholar, a professor of laws. Uh, he understands these issues intimately. I've known Murray for a long, long time. I am very excited. Uh, that he is uh, the member for Oak Bay Gordon Head, and I'm very excited uh, that he's taking on the job of implementing uh, the Declaration Act here in British Columbia. He knows it chapter and verse. He knows the players. Uh, uh, not as well as Scott Fraser did. Scott was the critic for a decade before he had the opportunity to be the minister, so he built relationships with Indigenous peoples in every corner of the province. Murray's a little bit behind on that, but... Uh, but those relationships will come easily when we're talking about partnerships and we're talking about rights and title as being affirmed, not being fought, which is how previous governments had approached these issues. So Murray knows these, the law better than anyone in the legislature. I can't think of a better person to do this work. Tanya, do you have a follow-up? Yes, please. Um, so you have your cabinet in place. You've got the next uh, sitting penciled in on the calendar for December. Uh, talk about the priorities now going forward and specifically with this $1,000 campaign promise for families. Yeah. Can you now guarantee that will be done by Christmas? I can guarantee that the legislature will be returning, uh, but we'll have a full debate and I can't speak for the official opposition. I can't speak for the Green Caucus. Uh, we'll have debates. Uh, legislation will be prepared. Uh, we will pass it. Uh, but we will have the debate that uh, our legislation and any legislation, quite frankly, deserves. Uh, but uh, in governments introduce bills uh, and open legislatures, oppositions close them. So that question's better asked to uh, the leader of the opposition and the leader of the Green Party. Uh, but it's my commitment to get the work done as quickly as possible. Uh, officials in the Ministry of Finance have been working on the logistics uh, since the uh, the writs were returned and the uh, majority government was confirmed by elections BC. Uh, the caretaker period was over and that work was begun. So uh, I don't know of any obstacles at the administrative level. The obstacle would be, can we get the legislation passed? And uh, uh, I, we have a majority, I'm confident we'll do that. Whether the checks get out to families and individuals before Christmas is a factor that will involve uh, 
administrative issues that I can't predict, uh, but it will certainly be in the not too distant future, either in December or very, very early in January. Our next question is from Lisa Yuzda, News 1130. Hi there, Premier. Hey. Looking to education, being that uh, Minister now, Whiteside, Jennifer Whiteside is, you know, new and being in such a challenging ministry, what do her priorities need to be? And are, what kind of guidance are you giving her in this very challenging ministry? Well, the, the mandate letter sends out pretty clearly the task for the minister. That's uh, how uh, government started. That's how we started back in 2017 and the government before that and the government before that. Uh, so the mandate letter directs the activities of the ministry within government. Uh, but Jennifer knows the, the challenges uh, in the system right now. And uh, she'll have the full support of myself and also uh, former Minister Fleming. Uh, she, the professional public service has been working on these issues for a long, long time. We have in place, uh, as you know very well, uh, Lisa, we have uh, plans in every school in British Columbia. We have trustees, we have administrators, we have uh, QP staff, we have uh, BCTF staff, all working together to troubleshoot, to find problems, and do our best to resolve them. Uh, Minister Whiteside will pick up the ball uh, where Minister Fleming left it and continue to advocate for children, to continue ad advocate for a safe continuance of our K-12 system until we can get to a place where uh, uh, we can get back to what everyone would like to call as normal. Do you have a follow-up, Lisa? I do. When you talk about, you know, the biggest problems that she needs to solve, I'm wondering what those are, and is one of those a broken relationship between the BCTF and government? Well, I wouldn't characterize it a broken relationship, quite frankly. It's the responsibility and the right of uh, members of the BC Teachers Federation to express their concerns uh, to the employer, which is the school boards and the, and the government. That is a relationship that has been in place for some time. We did negotiate uh, under Rob's leadership and the leadership of the current uh, executive of the BC Teachers Federation, a collective agreement that addressed a bunch of issues that had been left outstanding uh, by the former government. Uh, we implemented the elements of the Supreme Court a uh, decision that was won, hard fought by the BC Teachers Federation. I wouldn't characterize it as a broken relationship at all. I would characterize it as a, a dynamic system that involves a whole bunch of people. Most important in all of those people are the children. And as long as uh, the BCTF and the, the, the professionals that uh, get up every day to go to our schools, whether they be uh, education assistants, administrators, uh, clerical staff, teachers, everybody's focused on the best outcomes for kids, that's not a broken system. That's a system that has a lot of moving parts and it's our responsibility, not just government, but all of the players that I just mentioned, parents as well, to make sure that all those moving parts work seamlessly together. That's our objective. Will we meet that objective every day? Maybe not, but every day we need to try to make sure we're doing the best we can to get a quality education for our children in a safe environment for the people who work in our schools. Next question is from Fran Yanner, the GOAT. Are you there, Fran? Okay, we're going to move on to Les Lane. Are you there, Les? Yeah, I'm sorry. Hi. Premier, hey. I count one full-fledged full cabinet minister from outside the uh, south coast, the, the lower mainland. Um, you've got two, but one's just a minister of state. Is that kind of a a hole in your in your lineup well no i i think that our lineup is quite diverse uh, less as you know uh, different than i've ever seen in my 15 years as a member of the legislature uh, and we're working as best we can to make sure that the new people that have come in uh, get the uh, the grounding that they need to be good mlas which is not insignificant work and make sure that they're preparing for uh, the work of administering programs and delivering services for people uh, Nathan Cullen, Minister Cullen's responsibilities is, is to work with Minister Conroy to break up forest lands and natural resource operations. When we were sworn in in 2017, it was my desire to have a standalone Ministry of Forests, something that the former BC Liberals had rolled in to what is now one of the most unwieldy ministries within government, forest lands, natural resource operations and rural development. So uh, Minister Cullen's job is to work with Minister Conroy to disaggregate that and take component parts and move them to where they might be better utilized. And when that work is complete, that will become then 
Uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, again, we'll see how the, the work goes. A standalone Ministry of Forests with rural development attached to that and lands and natural resource operations as a standalone ministry as well, which would be a full ministry uh, with uh, significant human resources and so on. So this was, uh, I talked uh, at length with uh, my outgoing Deputy Minister Don Wright and my incoming uh, Deputy Lori Wanamaker, two uh, career professional public servants. I expressed my desire to have uh, two ministries where one existed, and they said, great ideas, but you don't want us to do that in the next two weeks, do you? And although I did, I took their good advice and said, let's find a way uh, with a four-year mandate ahead of us to do this correctly. The ministry was created uh, by Gordon Campbell just days before he resigned uh, as premier. If you go back through your files, Les, you'll remember that. And so the ministry was created, and the person who created it uh, left the building. And it's been existing for a decade, or almost a decade, uh, without any amendments or revisions. And I think it's an important part of, of our economic vitality, uh, certainly for us, but also to have the permitting and other processes uh, separated so that they can have a standalone minister. Another point I want to make is uh, Finn Donnelly is the Parliamentary Secretary for Salmon and Fish, uh, Salmon and Aquaculture. Uh, Finn's task is to work with uh, Lana Popham, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries, but also to work with Minister Cullen and to work with Minister Heyman to take those component parts that are spread across government, the provincial government, and bring them into one place so that we can focus on being equal partners with the federal government when it comes to saving our salmon uh, for this generation and future generations. It's something I know Finn is very well suited to do. A standalone ministry of fish did not make a lot of sense. It was tried in the past. The primary responsibility of primary jurisdiction rests in Ottawa. I wanted to make clear to Ottawa that British Columbians care deeply about salmon. They care deeply about the impacts of salmon aquaculture and the jobs that go with it. So to have uh, Finn Donnelly, the parliamentary secretary, to address all of those bits and pieces in government is part of what I think a renewed uh, government with a, with a majority mandate should do. So we're going to be doing some reorganization. We're not uh, tipping over the apple cart. That's, that would be uh, inappropriate. We're doing it in a thoughtful way. Uh, Minister Cullen will be part of that. Uh, Parliamentary Secretary Donnelly will be part of that. Minister Heyman will be part of that as we build out what we believe will be a more, co co more coherent system for decision making. Do you have a follow up, Les? Don't make me say that again. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Um, does your change at the top of the education ministry reflect dissatisfaction with all the tension and anxiety and, and confusion about how to keep schools open safely? No, not at all. Uh, as I said before, I think Rob Fleming did a, an outstanding job under very, very difficult circumstances. Uh, education is a challenge because of the diversity of stakeholders that at their core come together to care for children and give them a quality education. This is not simple, and it's certainly not simple in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, I believe uh, that the change will be good for the system, it'll be good for the two ministers, and the outcomes will be uh, there to be judged in the future. We're gonna go back to Fran Yanner, who I believe is on the line now. Are you there, Fran? Oh no, we've lost Fran again. Hello. Oh, no, we no, I'm, I Go ahead. Yeah, I don't, know. I don't know what's going on. I wasn't on mute, but I'll try it again. Um, Premier, this, my question is on the spirit of collaboration and cooperation referenced by Lieutenant Governor and yourself today. And uh, the new opposition leader has said um, the pandemic has brought parties together in a common cause, and she opened the door to the idea of tackling more issues together. Just wondering, uh, given the changes since October 24th, if you see promise here for more opportunities to work more cooperatively. Uh, absolutely. I said in my uh, opening remarks that uh, uh, MLA Bond and I, uh, opposition leader Bond and I, have worked uh, together for 15 years as uh, adversaries, admittedly, uh, but we share a lot of commonalities. And uh, I have great respect for her, and I, I'd like to think that it's mutual. And I'm confident that we'll be able to work well together. I'm also very confident that she will hold me accountable as I did her. Uh, I think that's a positive uh, relationship. And uh, Shirley and I are mature enough uh, to take these, uh, these things in stride. 
Uh, I know that she will uh, be quick to uh, respond to any failings of mine, but I also know she'll be quick to offer support uh, where it's required. And I look forward to that relationship uh, as I have the past 15 years. Fran, do you have a follow-up question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, this one is also related. The interim Liberal leader has also indicated her party needs to look uh, needs to go to British Columbians, and especially in the urban areas, to understand what voters wanted that her party, their party, did not um, deliver. I'm just wondering. The NDP did very well, obviously, but are underrepresented in um, rural interior in the north. Mm -hmm. Do you, does the government have similar plans to engage citizens in those areas? particularly the North, to understand why the government's work didn't resonate into uh, votes? Uh, I, I absolutely do. And uh, one of the disappointments uh, for me coming out of the uh, October uh, general election was uh, only seeing a, a new member in uh, Vernon Monashi and a new member in uh, Boundary Similkameen from rural British Columbia. I spent a lot of uh, my energies working on issues around resource development, which are so critically important in uh, rural British Columbia. I spent a lot of time building relationships, and I still have those relationships with local governments, uh, mayors in Quesnel, Prince George, uh, uh, Vanderhoof, uh, Fort St. James, Fort St. John, although uh, um, Mayor Ackerman and I haven't talked in a while, we do know each other, and uh, Mayor Bumstead and Dawson Creek. So I, I believe that the elected leadership at local government levels uh, are, are prepared to work with me as I am with them, and that's where uh, I get the, the best inputs on, on how best to uh, to meet the challenges in rural British Columbia. But as the federal, or pardon me, as the BC Liberals have challenges in urban British Columbia, uh, New Democrats need to work harder to make sure that our message is resonating in rural BC. And perhaps uh, Shirley and I will cross paths in each other at the airport when I'm going north and she's coming south. We have time for one more question, and it's going to come from Nick Johansson, Castanet. Hi, Premier. With regards to the new men's mask order here in BC, uh, can you speak to how retail and other workers are supposed to discern between people who are legitimately exempt from the mask rules and uh, those people who Dr. Henry yesterday called uh, belligerent in their opposition yeah. to the mandate? Well, again, I, I'd like to think, and our approach, Dr. Henry and I and Minister Dix from the beginning has been, I've been talking about wearing masks as they have. If you can't physically distance, wear a mask. Uh, the demands, uh, the requirements, or the call for mandatory mask wearing uh, became clear to us that uh, the uh, public was uh, taking advantage of retailers. Uh, I know in the restaurant sector, I spoke with uh, uh, the head of the restaurant association yesterday. I remember going into my own community into a local steakhouse where a group of belligerent, and I'll call them that as well, belligerent clients or customers uh, were uh, uh, abusing uh, two young uh, staffers, uh, table uh, waiters and a receptionist about uh, them wanting to sit at one table. That's just not the way we should act as, uh, as adults, first of all, particularly working with uh, ad addressing young people, perhaps in their first job, that they're not there to be public health officers, they're there to serve food and to meet the needs of, uh, of their, their customers. And similarly in the retail sector, if people are belligerent, I believe that's where the mandatory mask mandate and enforcement is imperative. It's not acceptable to be belligerent about putting on a mask to protect other people. And I believe that the vast majority of British Columbians get that. Those that don't uh, will be uh, liable to fines uh, and uh, perhaps uh, further, depending on just how belligerent they are. But we have always, uh, Dr. Henry, Minister Dix and I, have always been of the view that the best way forward is not to have increased enforcement but to have increased compassion for each other. And, and I believe that that should be our first, second, and third move. And the fourth move is you got to wear a mask. Don't be stupid about it. Put it on. Go buy your groceries. Take it off when you get to your car and get on with your life. This is not something that people should get overwrought about. There's lots of things in this world to be despondent about, to be angry at. Putting on a mask should not be one of them. Nick, do you have a follow-up? I do. Uh, with respect, Premier, my question is more about uh, these workers who are on the front line dealing with this small, ma small minority yeah. of people who, uh, who are treating this as, a, as an infringement on their freedoms and, and who are uh, being belligerent, as Dr. Henry says. Yeah. Um, will these frontline workers be required to ask for medical proof, or, or how will they discern yeah. between 
between people who legitimately have issues versus this belligerent crowd. Well, those, those issues are being addressed by public health as well as uh, Minister of Solicitor General and Public Safety. Uh, Minister Farmworth had some words on that question yesterday as well. Uh, he's responsible for the enforcement components and he'll be working with uh, retailers and those that are on the front lines uh, uh, working to, to provide services for people in a very, very difficult time. Uh, I hope that that gets close to answering your question, but uh, uh, belligerent people should be uh, should w grow up, and and those that have legitimate reasons they're not able to wear a mask will be working through those issues with Dr. Henry and others to confirm what legitimate reasons to not put a mask on are, and we'll deal with that in the days ahead. Thanks, everyone. That's all the time we have. Thanks, everybody.